Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is Corey Heights. Some battles. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if they got us. If they did, maybe. maybe. So you will get better as a player during that year. So it was kind of exciting. Like, oh, yeah, somebody wants me. Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast with Corey Heights. On today's edition, we're going to be hosting uh, an interview with Coach Whit Lejour from Bridgeton Academy. And Coach Lejour has a long history in the basketball world. Um, he's been at Bridgeton for some time and before that, New Hampton, and he was also a D1 coach. So, Whit, thanks for joining us this morning. How's it going? Appreciate it, Corey. Very good. So. I want to start out, I, I just gave a brief overview of your background there. Why don't you tell us a little bit about where you grew up, why you picked basketball, and, and, and your, a little bit about your coaching history. Yeah, so I grew up in a, a small town, big basketball town outside of Massachusetts, uh, perennial state champs, uh, you know, go to the old Boston Garden for the tech tournament and, you know, get to the get to the games as a kid, you know, at halftime in the JV game just to get a seat and all that sort of stuff. And to some degree, I think kind of basketball chose me as much as I might have chose it. Uh, my mom says that from a young age, that's something I, I want to do watching you know, Al McGuire, you know, we used to watch Channel 27 out of Worcester, great division two basketball and all that sort of stuff. And, and uh, then, you know, just was fortunate enough to run into some great people at a young age that got me further hooked. Gotcha. Did you play in college? I did. I played at Hobart College. Shout out to the Statesman. Uh, wasn't much of a player there or anything else, but, uh, you know, sometimes out of the ashes come other things. So I'm, I'm my son is actually up there now and their team has been terrific, and it's been just a blast to see him and the team have so much success. Oh, God. See, I never knew you went to Hobart. Now I see the connection with you and, and your son with that. That's pretty cool, huh? Yeah, very cool. Gotcha. Now, after Hobart, when did coaching start for you? Or did it start right away, or did you take a break to do other things? Well, you know what? I was lucky. My, my uh, high school coach as a senior uh, was tremendous, kind of uh, Rich McLeod, and, and uh, I coached the – uh, high school team in the summer league for years while I was in college. So I was actually getting experience there. And uh, it, it was a Framingham summer league and uh, Smokey Marisi, Hall of Fame, Massachusetts coach, who was the coach of David Blatt for any of you international or, you know, David, right. So, um, you know, I kind of got to start there and then out of Hobart, almost on a whim, um, you know, got involved in the prep scene and, and landed the uh, head coach, head coaching job at New Hampton um, right out of college first year. So that's that's a story in itself. But needless to say, um, pretty fortunate development at a young age for me. How many years were you there? Nine years. What years were those? 82 to 91. OK, does that when Pat Knight went there? Pat Knight went there. I coached Pat Knight. Um, you know, his dad was tremendous. Um, I've always said that I think that when Bob Knight sent his son to prep school, now, again, there'd been plenty of other folks doing it, but that, I would say that that gained kind of the public knowledge of what that year could be all about. And next thing you know, you know, everyone was sending their son to prep school. So that was, that was a piece of how the thing took off. I think. Walk me through that. Did, did you, did he recruit some of your players and knew about you in New Hampton or, and he must've talked to other schools as well. What's give me more background on that if you don't mind. Okay. Yeah. I mean, he definitely talked to a few other schools. So um, had not recruited them. True story. God strike me dead. Uh, they called up. I was happened to be in the admissions office and um, I think his, her name was Mary, but secretary for coach Knight said, Hey, we've got coach Knight on the other line. I, you know, I, honest to God, I know you, I've heard this myself. I said, yeah, 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 yeah. Boom. I hung up the phone and uh, called back. Hey, it's coach Knight. And said, Oh my goodness, God, I, I don't think I slept for 48 hours, but uh, they took a trip out to new England and visited Worcester Academy and ourselves and a couple other places. And, you know, ended up uh, obviously coming with us. And uh, that, that was, you know, Again, that, that was a good year. Pat was a terrific guy and a fun guy and, and, and all of that. So. so you really think, in your opinion, that helped put the New England prep school world a little bit more on the map to people in the rest of the country? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that it played a role. I'm not trying to make more of it because Worcester and D. Rowe and Tom Blackburn had done their thing. Fletcher Arrett down at Fork Union had 
rule, you know, all sorts of things to get into. But I think that uh, that did put a national uh, uh, spotlight, if you will, on it. Um, and, and so all of a sudden prep school was not just for the kid who needed it or, you know, some other such reason, you know, cause I, I think Knight explained to some people like, why wouldn't you do it? Your kid gets a year older, then gets to college. Now you get this. I mean, there's no real downside to it. And, and, you know, we had uh, George Raveling's son, right. George, former coach and Nike guy and all that. I mean, I think he enrolled at our school about two weeks after, uh, Coach Nice decision. So, I mean, I, I think it did have some impact on the credibility of what it was all about. Was it a foregone conclusion Pat was going to go play for his dad? Uh, that was not a foregone conclusion. No, that was not. And I think uh, finding the right fit was um, a big part of that. And I remember telling Pat, uh, you know, cause at one point, you know, should he, shouldn't he, this and that. And I said, I said, listen, the only thing I'm going to tell you is when I look in our locker room, uh, you know, if, if, if Indiana and Bob Knight offered 12 guys, the opportunity to go to Indiana, I don't see too many guys in there turning it down. And, and so that, you know, if you fast forward to graduation or uh, senior night at Indiana, which I, I just saw on TV or clips of it or something when, you know, coach Knight spoke so glowingly of Patrick, I mean, that was an incredible you know, because it doesn't always go like that. Right. So happy for them that it did. Right. After New Hampton, what where'd uh, where'd you go? Uh, University of New Hampshire. Jim Boylan, who I had, you know, was the former guard for the Marquette and McGuire and all that, offered me a like a restricted earnings at that time, which they really barely had. It was very restricted. Um, and uh, you know, we had a sabbatical program at New Hampton where you could do something and. I knew I wanted to, you know, I mean, obviously I loved New Hampton was great to me, but you know, I was a man to man, the uh, defensive guy, motion guy. I said, I got to get college experience. I got to go see what the best of the best are, are doing with this stuff. So, um, you know, went with Jimmy and he was really good to me. Um, UNH was great. Jay Wright was in the league at the time, starting out at Hofstra, Mike Bray, right. Um, you know, the, the, you know, you know, the deal, the, the video work, the, the level of, you know, uh, it's, it's a whole different thing at the college level. So that, that was a great experience for me. What's the one main thing you learned that you took away from that year? Uh, I mean, I, I think the all encompassing aspect of the job, the attention to detail, certainly the video work, you know, um, I would say those are the things, but I, I think the common denominator in all of it is connecting to the players. Mm -hmm. I mean, honestly, and, and so that played a role in me getting back to Bridgeton because we had about five or six prep kids on that team. My, my first year, you know, one kid, a couple of kids, St. Thomas Moore, Northfield, Mount Herman, uh, Fork Union, MCI, New Hampton. I mean, all the, we had a bunch of prep guys and they're upperclassmen. And I'm sitting around and they're all talking about what, you know, their prep year. And I was like, holy smokes, you guys really valued that. Again, back to what, a little bit what we were talking about earlier. This wasn't just something you did and, you know, okay, great. And then moved on and forgot about. This was life changing to some degree. And when I saw the kind, and those are all good guys, obviously, right? But when I saw the, the you know, the, the meaning that they put into the year and, and the fact that years later they, they recounted it so fondly, you know, obviously it made me feel good about what we had done at New Hampton, but, but in coming to Bridgeton and said, okay, I know what I'm doing matters or can matter. So that, that was very motivating. So you did Bridgeton right after that sabbatical year at New Hampshire? I mean, sure. I actually spent a year, um, you know, I was on a staff ultimately that got fired at New Hampshire, which, you know, I had an old uh, academic friend of mine said, you haven't lived until you've been fired anyway. So I got a little taste of that after five years, but Scottsdale Community College, the artichokes, Ron Michael, MBA guy, uh, Jimmy Boylan knew. So I was an extremely uh, volunteer guy, kind of hanger on her. Uh, I was used in some of the golf tournaments. You know, that was about my role. Hey, Wick, go play with a couple of alums. But, um, you know, it was a lot of fun in that in for one year in the uh, in the league out there in the junior college league in Arizona. So from there to to Bridgeton. So you've been at every level pretty much, prep school, high school, JUCO, D1. So you've got a great perspective on 
just the, the basketball landscape world. And I guess the one thing you're missing is the NBA, but you have no desire to do that. I'm guessing. Right. I don't know. Never say never. I've got, okay. you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I know I'm, I'm on the back nine myself, so I understand where I'm at in my career, but you know, there's a few things I could do. So never, never, you know, who knows? So help me on this. You've been in the prep school world since the early eighties. What's the biggest change between the players and the parents and the style from when you started to where we're at in current day? Right. So, I mean, I think the biggest change is the number of schools that are playing competitive basketball. That's the biggest change that the schools of every ilk, you know, in New England and beyond are putting out a prep school, boarding school basketball team that's pretty darn pretty competitive, you know, and so say some of those teams back in the day that were very good prep school teams, you know, today would be extraordinary, you know, would be extremely average. Mm -hmm. So to me, and, and right. And I, and I'm at Bridgeton in New Hampton. So I, I, you know, I don't, I'm not throwing stones uh, at anyone, but I would say some of the folks, you know, putting out great basketball teams are people back in the day that would kind of poo poo sports. You know, that would say, oh, you're too athletic, you know, the old, you know, you're, you're a jock school or you're this or that, right? But, you know, I think the same thing, it mirrors what's happening at the college level. There are colleges today at every level, you know, with, with strong athletic programs that probably, you know, at the same time period weren't putting out too much of a team. But, but youth sports and the way we value sports in this country, I mean, that, that shift is reflected everywhere, in my opinion. So, but if you said, hey, what's the biggest change? It's, it's you know, how many people are putting out good teams. And then, you know, I mean, I think there's other changes that go along with that too. Parents, what's the difference between the eighties to now? Are they more involved? Uh, more involved in general, you know? And so then when they're less involved, usually that parent is self-aware enough to say, Hey, wit, I'm not one of those parents, mm. you know, cause we've all been around it enough. And, and usually they're, they're, they may, or they may not be, I mean, they're, you know, so that's, but, most of the time, that's good. I, I heard this from a college coach, and I, I, it's helped me in the past several years when I heard it made a lot of sense to me about, hey, listen, you're not just recruiting you know, a player. You're recruiting a, a family. You know, you're recruiting the parents, too. So, again, it's not an exact science. I'm not going to pretend to be you know, Joe recruiter guy, uh, but there's a lot of truth in that, in that uh, statement. As a parent that's been – from your initial conversation, someone that could be an issue, has that caused you to not move forward with the kid because you didn't want to deal with the family? Uh, yeah, I mean, I've, you know, I mean, I've, yeah. I mean, sometimes early, you know, you red flags, right? I mean, coaches look for red flags. They're looking for red flags. I don't get every, you know, I mean, I don't get every family that I'd like to get here either that maybe they see something with me or the school they, that doesn't seem right or this and that, right? So it's, it's always a feeling out process. Uh, particularly when prep school is so new to most people that are looking at it. So uh, yeah, there are times when I shy away, you know, I, and uh, uh, the, the former coach at NYU, I once heard him say, you know, if he ever heard, I tell this to my players, but he said, look at, if I hear a co if I hear a young man, if I hear a kid, you know, uh, speak badly about his, any coach he's had, because I, I don't recruit him. I, I've always wanted to ask Joe whether or not, you know, as he got older and, you know, did that would be pretty hard these days. You might not be right. recruiting a lot of guys, you know, right. but, um, but I, I think there's, I'm always, you know, my antenna goes up anytime someone starts talking too poorly about a coach. Um, I go, ah, you know, and I, and I, you know, pretty, pretty interesting. Well, the one thing I always say, and I think we might've discussed this is people looking for a post-grad year or a prep school usually aren't satisfied. Right. Yeah. Right. And that's so you, okay. Yeah. yeah. That's okay. It's just perspective, right? It's, it's, it's what you do with that. You know, you want more, the guys that come to Bridgeton want, they want more, they want something they don't have. And that, that's, that's good. I do too, you know, but now, you know, how do you go about that? Right. Now we've been talking about your, your school Bridgeton. You've been there quite a while. Now, why don't you give uh, listeners that don't know much about your school, a little overview because your school is a little bit different than your, you know, majority of the prep schools out there. Yeah, so I, I think the uh, the fundamental difference is that we are solely post grad. I mean, and that's not even that. I mean, we've had a couple of two year kids over the years, but we're we're basically a post graduate school. So one and done, right? Calipari's made what we've done uh, forever. He he's kind of made it famous, but 
Uh, I think the fact that we're postgraduate boys makes us different. Um, I think that means the focus is on that cohort, right? So those postgrads, the PGs are our business. They're not simply an add-on to a nine through 12 structure. Uh, you know, they make up our school. They are the identity of our school every year. So the focus is, you know, the, they get the attention. It's, it's them. Uh, so I think those are the two things we like. I, I think it's a family oriented place. Sometimes you hear the word brotherhood is, you know, because of the guys and the closeness and all of that. But um, I think that's what makes it uh, part of what makes it special. Yeah, but since you have a, since you're cleaning house every year, it, every year must have its own personality among the student body, right? Yeah, it really does. I mean, and and I know there there was a particularly uh, rough year early on for me, uh, not for me personally, but in the school. It was just you know, it was just the the chemistry of the school wasn't right, and you know, a few discipline problems, right, that all schools go through. And I remember going to uh, the director of admission at that time and saying, man, I, I don't know, maybe maybe this thing isn't tenable, like just asking 160 guys to come to Maine and kind of be holed up in this sort of environment, right, where there's not a, not a lot to do and, you know, everything that you and I both know, um, the isolation and the the intensity of the experience. I said, man, maybe, you know, maybe, maybe this is a thing of the past. And then, you know, flip a switch and the next year, you, you've got zero issues, great thing, this and that. And, I, and, and I'll tell you what's interesting, and I, I don't want to jinx us either, but the last couple of years and several years have been, by and large, really good ones here. Uh, and, and like I go, wow, kids, you know, and, and you hear some people in education say this, but young men, this, this is a great year. You know, this is, this is a really valuable year. So there was at one time I was saying, I, I don't know if this thing's, you know, either tenable or how... You, but I think it's, it, it's, it's in a way it's better than ever. And, and we have, again, knock on wood, less issues than ever. A lot of good guys and, you know, managing the situation. Maybe sometimes, maybe that's because, you know, they have cell phone. Maybe they have access to the outside now that they didn't back in the day. And, you know, half our problems might have been because I had 20 guys in the dorm lined up for a payphone looking to talk to their girlfriend and, you know, willing to, you know, beat the snot out of each other for their five minutes to, you know, to call home. So, uh, you know, we don't have to worry about that anymore. Right. You know, Fork Union still didn't allow cell phones. Uh, so I've got a kid there now. And that was, uh, and I actually had my, um, my cousins tour it a couple of years ago. And that to them was a deal killer. Like we can't do that. Yeah. that is, we, we cannot fathom just having like a one hour a night for our phone to be turned on actual landline phone. So uh, it still does exist out there, but of course, Fork Union is its own animal anyway. So yeah, and I, I have fond regard. I mean, I do shout out again to Fletcher, our legendary coach, Matt Donahue, I've gotten to know all the people down there, phenomenal job. So I know, you know, they used to be up against it. I mean, they, they, they were it. I mean, Fletcher Arrett was it. It was, it was really Tommy Blackburn at Worcester and Fletcher Arrett at a whole nother level. When I told some college, when I told a few friends of mine that I was going to play Fork Union, he looked at me and said, are you out of your mind? Do you, do you know what you're running into? And, you know, blah, but, but totally did it the right way. So Fletcher Arrett's a guy that was really good to me as a young coach when I was at New Hampton. Right. I used Last to say, in fact, I'll tell you what, you know, we mentioned Pat Knight. I mean, Fork Union has much to do with building New Hampton and the New England prep school brand, right? If, if we're talking about the same time period, basically, a little earlier, but they'd bring their team up. And I mean, they would bring in coaches just galore to our gym. Uh, that, that's a fact. Fork, I, I used to say that I forgot that, but Fork Union did as much for helping not only me personally, but they, they built the brand in New Hampton by their willingness to travel up, you know, and we'd go down there for their for a holiday tournament, but that's a fact. So I kind of, you know, I mean, to me, I, if you look at our schedule, we play a lot of people and we play a lot of people we don't need to play. And, and part of that is, you know what, there were, there were some, there were a lot of folks that were good to me and, you know, I, I'm not going to try to, I'm, I'm not saying I'm as good of a guy as Fletcher Arrett or nothing else, but I'm, I'm saying that, you know, you got to pay it back too. Absolutely. You know, we talk about the benefit, when you talk to kids, when I talk to kids for the first time, we always mention the benefits of going to prep school or doing a postgrad year. And one of those is emotional maturity. And, you know, what I tell families is, look, when you, whenever you leave home, you're going to get homesick. 
right? And you get through that at prep school. So when you step foot on a college campus, it's, it's not going to be a big deal where your other freshman teammates and classmates are probably going to be experiencing it. So when you get 160 guys on campus away from home for the first time all together, what do you do at Bridgeton to kind of get them through the homesickness and get them to bond for the upcoming year? Well, I think that's the goal of the orientation program. So it's, it's wading into the water a little bit. Um, it's, you know, as you know, first impressions are big. So there's a structure there right away that's in place that they get a sense of, um, you know, Hey, here, you know, here are the rules and right here, here's the lay of the land. And, and I think it's the community working together, which is what has to happen in, in environments like this. Right. Uh, so yeah, it's the academic community with the residential life community, with the athletic community, trying to piece the thing together and without making it tedious, right? Because orientation programs can be awful if they're, you know, so you got to, you got to get a lot done in a relatively short period of time and, and get, just get the thing moving in the right direction, just like you do with a team, I think. And so through that, you know, weekend of a variety of events, really extending into a week, you, you know, and, and, and you're so structure and support, you know, and you, everyone's keeping their eyes open. And, you know, as far as the homesickness or that, that piece of it, right. There are some kids that have it, you know, on the drive up here or the, you know, the, I mean, they have it before they get here. And then there's some that it hits while they're here early on some it's, it's down the line. So we all, you know, there's no, you're right. There's, you know, but most kids are going to get it in some form or another and have to get beyond it. Right. Now, when you, recruit players you're looking at highlight tapes you're looking at game film you're talking to coaches that you know but really you're not maybe normal years especially COVID years you're not seeing these guys in person right, right. so you're it's, it's kind of a gamble um, it's almost like a fantasy draft when you're picking your guys and they commit to you and then they get on campus and sometimes they're better for you sometimes they're not as good tell me a story of one of the biggest surprises you've ever had where you recruited a kid maybe you haven't seen him in person but he gets on campus and just just wows you yeah, I mean, the one that, that jumps out at me, right, is, is say in my uh, second year, really the first, so my, my first recruiting class, uh, there was a kid from uh, New Hampshire by the name of Craig Griffin, he's not a kid anymore, and, you know, he'd obviously looked at New Hampton because he was a New Hampshire kid and this and that, and uh, I, I don't know where else he looked, but, uh, you know, basically they, they, didn't think he was good enough or, you know, didn't think he had everything that maybe they were looking for, whatever that was. So he kind of came up here and then me having my little New Hampton background and knowing that, you know, they didn't quite want to go with him. Right. I did, you know, if I'm, I'm not afraid of sticking it to someone if, you know, in a friendly, nice way, if I, if I can. And, um, but I, I certainly didn't know what we were getting um, with Craig Griffin. I knew what people said about him a little bit. He had no scholarship offers. I, so, and he, you know, strong personality kid, blah, blah, blah. Hey, listen, and he, he's one of the toughest SOBs I've ever coached. And he, he's, he, you know, he, 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 right from day one. And we had some better, uh, you know, looking players and maybe even all around skill guys in that group. Uh, and, I, and I'll never forget going up to our starting center, uh, Delvar Barrett, who had gone to Ohio U. He was a kid out of Detroit and played for legendary coach Ben Kelso. And I said, hey, Delvar, like, who do you like next to you? You know, like, who, who, who do you think should be starting at the four, basically? Like, trying to, you know, because I knew what I thought, but I wasn't sure, you know. He goes, hey, coach, I like Griff. And I said, good, me too. But as long as he signed off on it, I said, okay. And, you know, I, I've got more stories. Uh, he, he ran, he set a screen. I mean, he was, and, you know, Max Good called me up one day with the coaches in the league think, you know, Craig Griffin. And I said, Max, cut it out. And I, you know, I, this is, I know where I was sitting when he, I said, Max, you would love this kid. He goes, ah, and he started laughing. He goes, I know you're right. I, I, I said, yeah, you would love him. He goes to Merrimack, was a four-year starter and terrific player, but that wasn't easy. I mean, Bert Hamill, God rest his soul, my my closest, you know, no one has been better. You know, he, Bert Hamill, instrumental in my coaching life. And I said, Bert, if you ever listen to one word I've said, ever, you take this kid, you take this kid. And uh, so I call that the Griff Clause now. 
like when I have a kid and there's a few coaches that say in New England that know knew Craig and kind of know his story. So this kid, we had this last year, Sean Trumper is down at Franklin Pierce with David Chadbourne and David has had a guy or two from us and this and that and knew Griff's story. Cause he was from down that way. I said, I said, uh, yeah, I, uh, I said, Hey, David, this is Griff, man. This is Griff all over. It's like, like you want this kid. He texted me about, you know, again, don't want, don't want to jinx him, but he texted him, David texted me about two, three weeks ago. And he said, with, I love him. And I said, good. I said, I thought you would. And didn't have to, you know, didn't have to beat anyone out. I mean, that gets into a whole nother thing about placement, but that that's one, like every year, you, you, you know, it's just that, that, that sticks out to me, but you know, Billy Sheik last year is another guy, a little guy from the West Coast out of, you know, Portland. And, and uh, uh, he, he uh, comes in here and, and I think he took like six charges in our first practice and our first workout. OK, well, yeah, he took more charges in the first week than the previous year's team did all year. I mean, that you know, so. That's great. Now, without mentioning names, you probably were high on some kids and they came in and they disappointed. What, when that happens, what's usually the case? Is it just maybe uh, they look good on tape or they just couldn't handle being away from home or it was teammates not mixing? What's an example of where it doesn't work out? Because we always talk about the success stories, but we got to talk about too, where this isn't for everybody and it doesn't, it's not a guarantee that it's going to work out. Yeah, no, it's not. Um, I think what happens is somehow, some way, obviously, uh, uh, some of what you say is there, right? So, you know, I, I often say the distraction is no distraction, right? The, the, you know, they're put in a unique environment. And so some of the, the, the fact that there's not their usual stuff ends up, you know, getting in, in, in their way. And, and so um it, it, it could be some things like that okay it's uh, a failure on my end maybe to connect with a kid I mean I think at the end of the day right when 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 the young man connects to and it doesn't have to be me I don't always have to be the point person right but if he connects to me or he connects to the school enough or my assistant coach or you know but there's got to be connection I mean that's what we got to do as a school so I think most of the failures come when you know, for one reason or another, we, we don't connect well enough. And, and obviously sometimes that's on the uh, kid's end for, for some of the reasons you're talking about, just not ready for it maybe, but sometimes that could be on our end too, our, our own failure, my own failure to, to reach a kid. And I, I could, you know, I mean, I'll tell you one story by name, just cause he, you know, David T came here, went on to Purdue. He's a top hundred guy and heck of a player shooting guard. And uh, he got into some trouble you know, late in the year, you know, disciplinary stuff. He didn't finish the year here and, um, you know, but went on to Purdue and did fine and played overseas. And uh, I, I got a phone call and a text from him about 10 years later. And he said, hey, coach, just want to say thanks. Want to say I'm sorry. You want to, you know, all the stuff that guys do. I said, you know, Dave, I appreciate it, you know, because the yada, yada, yada. Um, on my end, the truth, this is true now on my end, uh, on that particular team, I, I, I don't think I did as good a job as I could have. And I, you know, to, with him and to the team, I, I let him take a lot of shots, you know, like I, you know, and he, he was good. And I, and I, I don't, I don't know whether that led to, you know, continuing some poor decision-making on his end off the court, but I, you know, I said, God, I, I know I made a pact with myself that, you know, you, you, you just can't let guys you know you 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 can't put them in positions where they're, they're, they're going to hurt themselves so you know i some of that again i you know you, you learn i always tell the guys look at they they hopefully learn a lot while they're here and make no mistake about it that we we certainly do as adults too when you say you want someone that loves the game or is tough can you tell that on a highlight tape or does that actually come through in conversation or further research uh i would say that uh the toughness on in some cases, like there are some tapes where you can watch and say, you know, that kid, if that's real, uh, that kid's got a motor, right? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, and, and uh, particularly with bigger kids too, you know, and sometimes a wing, the way he finishes, um, 
trying to think real quick. A uh, kid we have this year, you know, a really good player for us, but I was just really impressed on tape, the way he took on contact. Because I think finishing at the rim is something that most kids going from high school to college are going to have to improve on. You know, it's just because there's less, there's more contact in the college game. There's bigger bodies. The, the, the talent level is more equal at every step, right? And so, you know, I, I saw that and I went, okay, I mean, my God, I think this kid takes on contact. And I, I happen to be right about that one. So you can see that one. Um, love of the game is more, maybe it comes through an in-person visit a little bit, right? I mean, that that's one, I mean, that's one of those intangibles that, that, um, you know, like, again, maybe you get that in, in a visit, it's not going to come, maybe, right, other, co their coaches or people that you'd call, right, to maybe speak of the kid. I've had coaches speak and, and I say, God, you sound like me, you know, kind of a little over dr dramatic, like I'm talking here, a little serious, like, you know, but really supportive of the kid. And I go, okay, like, I know, you know, you're, you're the same job I am, right. Trying to help guys get to the next place. And I'm going to, you know, if I have a good feel for that coach, if I have a, you know, if that, that and he's saying what he's saying, then I go, okay, mm -hmm. I, I, I probably like this kid. Do you know a good example of that is one of your recruits for next year, Michael Wolf uh, okay. from out here in Denver, Colorado. There's a picture of him online is that, or pictures dad sent me where it snowed out here and it was yeah. 10 at night and he spent an hour shoveling his uh, driveway to shoot. Right. So for me, that's, that's a, how many kids would do that? Right. Yeah, so for I, me, that tells me the love of the game right there. That's a good picture. That's a nice yeah. thing. If you're me, you're happy about that. You right. know? And that's, you know, every year. Uh, and now, you know, you, 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 we'll see what he does, but every, every year, that's why you, you want, and you, you, that, that's, that you want guys like that. Mm -hmm. So anyway. Right. So with that being said, how is this beer, this, with, with your current team you have now, How's it been calling coaches on their behalf? Like, has this been your most challenging year ever with the placement? No, because uh, one, I'd, I'd say it's exactly what so far now, right? Get back to me in, in, in a couple of months, all right? Once we've played a little bit more again, which it looks like we're going to do and, and all of that, okay? But, but I would say it's right where it normally is. There's, there's interest. Uh, there's colleges trying to quote steal. I mean, you know, there are colleges trying to get in on guys that normally they'd have no chance in heck at getting, but they understand they might be able to, because uh, I'm sure with my kids, I know that my guys home on break right now going, Oh my goodness, what, what am I doing? Where am I going? I've talked to some parents about that. Right. But the truth is, you know, for the last, I don't know what as many years as I can remember, at this time of year, that's the same thing. Like I've had college conversations at Thanksgiving and leading up to the holiday break in December. And then we come back in the second part of the prep year for most, of, I don't have guys signed, sealed, delivered coming in. I mean, that's just not part of my landscape. If I did, there'd be no issues. Right. But, but they're all prove it guys. Well, how do you prove it? Getting in, getting in front of people or, or putting a body of work together that suggests you know, whatever it is that, that, that you want. So the body of work so far is, you know, halfway through at best. Um, so, you know, we've probably got nervous kids and families. Um, but, you know, again, my sense is in the process, uh, we're going to make some things happen because you know what, I do have a good group of guys, a very good group of guys, in fact, this year again, right. And I think, knock on wood, uh, there's going to be some homes for them. But, you know, again, will it be exactly where every one of them wants to go? Will it be quite at the level? I don't know that yet, you know, but I, I think it will be for the lion's share of them and it'll, it'll work out. And if it doesn't work out exactly, last time I checked, right, there's people transferring all over the place. Now, you know, so I say, hey, guess what, guys, Mar you know, marriage isn't final anymore. Last time I checked, so. You know, I, I think you got to go into it all, all in. I want my guys going in all in, but, you know, be, hey, if you get under recruited, go out there and be the player of the year as a freshman. Let the world know you're that good. Guess what? More opportunities open up. They, they do, and we all know it. So, you know, no, COVID, you know, I'm going to say this to you too. I, I don't know who I was talking to recently. COVID is going to be the great out for people. Right. So COVID, COVID, COVID. Hey, look at, you know, 
COVID, you can't COVID away your, your, you know, your next five years. Right. You know, the world moves on, you know, and so you, you know, hey, well, I did COVID. That's like, you know, that's similar to the family that says a little bit too much, you know, ah, I just got no exposure. Really? In today's world, no exposure. That's why you didn't get anything because you got no exposure. Are you kidding me? We were in an ex overexposed world. So I'm not saying that that's never true. I'm just saying I always go, eh, I don't know. I don't know about that. And I don't know about the thing that COVID's going to get in the way of everybody. I don't buy it because I know talent wins. Talent will get where talent needs to get because that's the people above me, right? That's what they're paid to do. They're paid to bring in talent. Yeah. And what I've been saying, we've discussed this as well, you and I, is that, um, the guys that aren't going to play college basketball in this COVID year probably should have been playing anyway. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's just like the NBA a couple of years ago, they talked about just in theory, getting rid of four teams. We would have got rid of 60 guys that probably maybe shouldn't have been in the NBA anyway. And that would have raised the level of the other team. So in theory, D one should be better. D two should be better. D three should be better. So it should be trimming a lot of the fat. And for families that don't like this, well, what I've been saying to him with is, your son's had 18 years to work on this. Like, this is not just an overnight discovery. Amen. Like, yeah, you've had that much time to work on your resume and you can't catch up that quick in basketball unless you have a giant growth spurt. So the reason everyone chumps on division three is because there's no division four and no division five. So if we could institute a division four and division five to make room for the right? Billions of folks playing basketball where there are no longer enough roster spots on the college level, uh, that would ease things, uh, that would ease things a bit, right? Because that's, that's the truth. There's not enough roster spots. You, you division three of the rosters of 18 and 20 that, you know, it, it's so uh, anyway. Well, I've always told kids too, I was like, I'll find you a spot, but you might be paying full tuition. You might be the 22nd guy on the bench. You might be a, a school in a town of 4,000 people in Montana. Yeah. Right. So there's, yeah. there are spots, but yeah. I'm and then go prove it and then go yeah. do something with it. That That's disappointed me uh, a couple of times. Like you guy, yeah, I'll do anything just to da, 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 da. And then the guy gets there and doesn't, you know, say, doesn't stick it on. It's like, wait a second. We, I thought we said, this is what, you know, so that, that's something that's on the integrity that, that again, that's back to me. You can't get it right every time, but you know, I want solid guys. I, our whole thing has been based on solid guys that I can, place with college people they can come to Bridgeton respect you know what the kid has gone through here and done and, and know what they're getting so when when they get in there they 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 can deal with a little bit more college ready guy yeah and thinking about this too it's quality of life you know everyone probably you talk to wants to play d1 right mm -hmm. and maybe they go d1 they're playing in a gym with 400 people they never make it to the tournament or at the end of the bench or they can go to a d3 school right fit campus gets behind them they get some minutes they make lifelong friends it's just and you probably said this to you've turned blue but it's all about the right fit yeah and i and i think that's what you say is true for not only players but it's true for coaches uh pete carrill i was lucky enough to meet him we had a kid go to princeton a zillion years ago and we and then when i was at unh actually we were in a michigan state tournament and i watched an entire game sitting right next to pete carrill which obviously was my good fortune and and he said hey guess what you know because he he started out of muhlenberg right and and d3 and before princeton he goes you know last time i checked you, you're not taking tr trophies to the grave you know and he's talking about coaches so you know you you coach where you, I, you coach where you coach right there's good situation there's great situations everywhere and there's there's not so great situations everywhere and so uh, you might have a great situation division three, you might have a great situation division one, but a great situation division three is in fact a whole lot better than a, a, a worse situation division one. And a good prep school situation, look at how many college coaches, former college coaches are sitting in prep school right now talking about the changes, right? I know a lot of these guys reasonably well. And they're, you know, it's funny. Some will say, geez, wait, you've had a pretty good life. That looked pretty good. Jerry Quinn seemed to do this thing pretty good. Uh, you know, it's kind of, you know, there's a lot of, folks that have said okay i mean you know making that value judgment right that it's not necessarily about the level right now that being said i mean you know hey go go to the highest level you can I mean, go right if the you know i mean I, I don't i don't begrudge that either i see it both ways yeah well on some other future podcast you know i played d1 struggled 
uh, and, but it was my goal my entire life. And, yeah. uh, I had to join the military to do it and had to go fight in the middle East and had to take majors. I didn't want to take all to play D one. And, uh, it's, it's, I share that with kids all the time. Like, really, you'll do anything to play D one. And, um, it's just, it's, it's for everyone it has to make the individual decision, but a couple more questions and then we'll, we'll wrap yeah. up here. But, um, you have been in new England coaching against great teams. Most of your career, who one who is the best team you've ever played with and two who's the best player you've ever coached against um well the uh the best team we probably had at Bridgeton was the 07 team Paris Horn was my current assistant who went on to St. John's and had a fabulous career right Justin Burrell is over in Japan killing it and Brian Rudolph and, and, and we, we had a heck of a team that, um, you know, that year and, and probably the only year of our championship years where you could say, okay, we were, you know, we were on toe to toe, you know, nose to nose with anyone we played. Right. Um, but then you start saying, Hey, you know, wait, who, who are the best teams you've ever played against? Oh my goodness. God. Like, where do you want to start? Uh, so Fletcher Air, Fork Union, some of those teams with Kenny Williams, look them up back to North Carolina, Chris Washburn, the okay, legendary guy that went on to NC State. I mean, more players than you could imagine. Um, Kevin Keats's teams at Hargrave played them. There was a couple of those. Paris's year, my 07 Bridgeton team, we beat Hargrave twice that year and you go you go take a look at Hargrave's roster that year okay um uh, that was uh Chris Cheney and I with his his old Patterson teams uh tremendous okay now let's jump into New England Andre Drummond and Chris uh Ed Coda and some of the guys that Jerry Quinn has has rolled out look at the guys with Golden State uh, Pashal and the rest of them that, you know, he, I'm just doing so well. Right. So, um, now we haven't even talked about, uh, we haven't, we haven't talked about Max good at main central, you know, he's another guy that changed the prep landscape up the ante after the Patrick Knight thing. Cause he always, Max always told me what, you know, if I had been around when Pat Knight was going to prep school, he would have come to main central. I never told him this, but if you listen to your podcast, you'll hear it. You know, he's probably right. I wouldn't have got it. Well, Max is a friend of ours. So Max was my high school coach, his college coach. Oh, and then my cousin, Brad Miller, who played yeah. in the NBA 14 years, he left his senior year of high school and, you know, he probably coached against him up at MCI. And that oh, changed, yeah. that changed yeah. Brad's life and said he would not have made the NBA without that year with Max. So yeah, Max is tremendous. So luckily, yeah. I, you know, luckily uh, he wasn't around when, you know, so sorry, Max, but, and, and, uh, uh, so, I mean, and now some of, uh, uh, Jason Smith's teams at Brewster, I mean, you, you got to put them with the best of the best. I mean, there's no question about it. And, you know, I mean, I, I think in these right now, if you're talking about Brewster, then you got to talk about Northfield Mount Harmon cause they're there, you know, and then, and then you got good old staple New Hampton sitting there who won it all last year in New England, uh, who, you know, so that, that's what, I mean, oh my goodness. When you, when you talk about, uh, and by the way, now we're not talking about an awful lot of other good teams and coaches that I swore getting ready for this podcast. I said, oh boy, like, look at, there's a lot of good coaches and a lot of good teams. And so when you say, who's the best, hey, Whit, who's the best one you play? Whoever we're playing tomorrow. Yeah. And we're we're going to watch film on them, not to say that I'm, you know, and we're going to figure it out. And because I know there's, you know, it's, it's, uh, there's a lot of good teams and a lot of good coaches out there. Yeah, and even on a Tuesday night, you play in a single A team. You got to have your guard up too. Yeah. Make sure nothing happens. Uh, like if you're playing Jay Tilton or someone like that. Yeah, John McVeigh and his dad mm -hmm. uh, at Brooks. Like we were lucky. We got them two years ago, but I think two of the last three we played, they cleaned our clock, and and they did last. And it's like, oh my goodness, God. I mean, and he's you know he's it's a combination like Brooks. I mean. They, they have a good basketball team. I don't care what league they're in, okay? And, they're, and, and, and they have a commitment at their institution to have a good basketball team. And then, oh, by the way, John and his dad can flat out coach, like as good as anybody, right? And better than, you know, like I hear, come give me a clinic, okay? But um, so there, there's, uh, 
there's a lot of good, and, and that's exciting. I just saw the Vermont Academy. I'm sad to see Alex uh, go, but John Zoll is going to, you know, he's another college guy with NBA experience and all the above going to Vermont Academy. It's like, oh my God. So, you know, he's going to come in and do whatever it is Vermont Academy wants to do. And, you know, that's going to be a problem for Bridgeton. Yeah. Well, I tell you what, folks, if you're listening, uh, there's a podcast that Jeff Goodman did this summer where he has wit on Jason Smith, John Carroll, Chris Cheney, Kevin Keats, uh, Jerry Quinn, a few others. And it's a round table of just absolute prep school legends. And it only went on for an hour. That that honestly could have gone for about four hours and you guys could have tons of stories. But um, to get you out of here, Wit, last question. We've been talking a lot of basketball, a lot of prep school, but in your free time, when you're not coaching or recruiting or, or hanging out with your family, what are your hobbies? What keeps you busy? Right. So, I mean, it, when the weather gets good in Maine, which sometimes takes a while, right? Uh, I'm on the golf course. So I, I'm not, I'm, I'm, uh, my swing is not one to be copied, but I can, I can grind myself around the course and do okay. Uh, I think it's a, I love the competitive aspect of golf as anyone, you know, and, and I have a job where I, I can do that some and not feel, too guilty about time spent. Um, so I, I really do enjoy what golf brings, uh, just kind of quiets my brain most of the time. Um, my wife and I uh, binge, I mean, we binge Netflix and Prime and I mean, we're savages. Um, so I almost have to call binging, you know, uh, different shows that we watch a, a, a hobby. I'm a, I'm a workout guy, just right. You get older. So I'm, I'm not, you know, trying to set world records, but stay in a routine, you know, physically fit, um, feels pretty good. So read some. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know what? One of the things, right. I'm, I'm a college hoop fan, you know, right. Store up games, watch games. When I was at UNH, that's one of the things, I mean, that, that took enough of a grind where I remember I was in my first year of marriage watching the final four and I, turn to my wife right and, and say god this is like the first game that i've watched like i really was just enjoying the heck like having fun so i realized that, yeah because you, you end up watching so much tape and so many games that you know i mean i'm not and i think it's great i i it, it college is i mean it's the best job going if you got a good you know if you got a good situation going i know there's nothing better than college so don't don't get me wrong there but on the other hand uh, this allows enough space that you can, you know, remain kind of a fan of the game and fun of the game. And, you know, and I know the guys that are doing it right in college are able to find that balance too, but it's, it's tricky. Yeah, absolutely. But mind you, whenever a job like a Vermont Academy opens up, you've got tons of college coaches that want to get to your level because they can be in charge. It is not as much of a grind as it is at the, you know, assistant level at D1 or D2 or D3. So, there's very few coveted spots up there and it's just, it's just, it shows with the demand when a spot opens up. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and again, to do a good job, right. Every, every, every job demands its own, right. Uh, set of instructions. So, you know, they're, they're uh, the prep school thing. Everyone would tell you it's not, you know, uh, and I can only speak for the places I've been, but there's, you know, there, every, every job is, has its own challenges. Yeah. Well, Whit, thanks so much for hopping on this morning with me. Um, it is, uh, <laughs> we talk quite a bit. I consider you a friend and it's good to have you on uh, as uh, one of the first guests on the Prep Athletics podcast. And uh, you got a lot of great wisdom, a lot of great experiences. And uh, I'm just, it's, it's, you know, I'm glad to call you a friend, glad to call you a colleague. And I just can't wait to, you know, keep in touch with you and see how things pan out during these unprecedented times. Yeah, well, I mean, honestly, I, I, maybe it's just the unprecedented times and obviously, uh, you know, with what just gone on this week, I mean, just a uh, kind of a sadness and, a, and a, you know, I, I think hopefully we're all, you know, getting to a point where we say we, we can do better, but I'm, uh, I'm excited, feeling good. Uh, again, we're, we're as good as the guys we get. That's what keeps me going. Uh, family life, good, every, you know, so that's good. Hobart basketball, getting back to action, that's going to be good for me. Uh, and then all the, like the assistant coaches and players, I mean, I, I appreciate you taking the time to talk to me, but the longer you're in this thing, obviously the more you know, it's the people that you've been lucky enough to be surrounded, the people that have either hired me or supported me and, and all of that. And I, I know that. So, and I know, you know, I'm on the back nine, but that doesn't mean I got to fade away either. So we're going to go strong until we can't go strong anymore.
Oh, that sounds good. Well, Whit, thanks so much for joining me. This is Coach Whit LeJure from Bridgeton Academy. I'm Corey Heights. This is the Prep Athletics Podcast, and thank you all so much for tuning in. Thank you.